Special coverage from the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, here from the floor of the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to welcome Phillips Baker, former president and CEO over at Hecla, former chairman over at the Silver Institute, right. but you're still part of the executive committee, committee over at the Silver Institute. So I think the topic dictates itself, we're going to talk silver. Uh, we're going to talk macro, we're going to talk commodity itself, but also I'm curious like what you see and what you saw as your as your time as a, as you're in your role as the CEO of Hecla in terms of silver landscape, of course, right? Well, gl glad to. And you know, let me just start with where where I was, you know, when I started with Hecla and where silver was. It was literally at $4.10. It was at the uh, 36 year low for for silver. And uh, it's been a great ride ever ever since. Um, the company's market cap was probably about eighty million dollars. Um, ended up uh, before I left to be right at four billion dollars. And the growth in silver at Hecla was pretty dramatic. We uh, we became the by far the largest silver producer, producing almost half the silver produced in the United States. And uh, we're on a path to do the same in Canada with uh, with this new property, Kino Hill. What was your biggest challenge as the CEO of Hecla? Biggest challenge at the, as the CEO, um, I, th I think it was sort of changing the direction of the company. When I arrived, the the focus was in Venezuela. We were the largest gold producer in Venezuela, and uh, it was just not a place to to be, as you can appreciate now. Um, and so just changing that direction. And in order to do that, we needed to acquire the portion of Greens Creek that we didn't already own. And it was just a game changing acquisition. And then there's been a series of acquisitions since. Yeah. America's largest silver producer, or US largest silver producer. Like, how much of a legacy problem is that? Like when you, when you look at that, like how do you maintain that? Because um, silver, as we all know, is a very difficult asset. There are not a lot of pure play assets. Like, question sort of targeted towards the landscape out there like how do you keep the pipeline full well look i I, th I think for silver companies it's a real challenge um there's not a lot of uh, new silver assets and those assets that are, uh, are coming around or you know tend to not have as long a life as what what hecla um, has and and had um so it's a, it's a it's a real challenge and you know for the industry it's a big challenge because uh, there are not r really large silver mines. Uh, you know, the, the largest silver, well, the largest mine uh, producer of silver is, is uh, 44 million ounces. The next largest, which uh, is uh, Hindustan Zinc in mm -hmm. India, is 18 million ounces. <laughs> and then it goes down from, down from there. Well, that's not a lot. If you if even convert that into uh, into gold, for example, a lot of people convert that into gold equivalent ounces. It's not that much. No, no, it's not. Uh, you know, look, a uh, three hundred thousand ounce gold deposit is a you know, annual producer is a big silver mine. Absolutely, yeah. That's why it's so challenging, I guess, yeah. as well, to really keep that pipeline full and keep that uh, production level up, yeah, as well, and to get it to grow. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's the hardest part is um, having it grow. Yeah. And and if you look at if you look at the silver mines look at all the mines that produce silver they produce about 800 million ounces in aggregate it's been 800 million ounces for the last 12 years so there is no real growth in in the production of, of silver I want to talk macro in a minute with you yeah, as well sure. about the silver but uh, on, on the landscape where, where's the perspective right now if you were looking for a new silver mine like maybe as, as a hack class CEO at the time like where, where, where were you looking where would you feel comfortable Look, I, I, you know, you have to be willing to go where silver is. Um, so, you know, certainly in Latin America, you, you know, just about any of the major company countries that produce silver. So, so you know, Peru, Mexico, uh, Bolivia. You've got to be prepared to Argentina. You got to be prepared to go to those countries. So, we were certainly prepared to do that. Um, and then, if you think about Africa, there is no silver production south of the Atlas Mountains. So, you know, you, you certainly see what the guys are doing with Aya in, in Morocco. Uh, and so you got to be prepared to go to someplace like that. 
And if you if you think about the rest of the world, there's not a lot of a lot of choices. Um, uh, you know, Australia would be a choice, but most of it's very low grade. As heck, like I keep coming back to it as, as well, but I, I think the role of some of the mid-tier major producers is also to sort of nurture the, the juniors, in my opinion, especially when the markets have dried up and sure. capital markets are still iffy out there. Um, where, where are you looking at investing and supporting some of those junior companies maybe coming in as a 9.9% shareholder? Would you, would you have seen that as a role for Hecla to do that or maybe even generalizing it for the majors mid-tiers to do so? Yeah, look, I think there's an element of, of those investments that, that the larger companies need to make in the, in the junior companies. And that's happening. You, you, you see that occurring. Um, yeah, and, and certainly we were doing that. Um, but that only goes so far because you know, the, the expenditures that need to be made over an extended period of time are quite large. And you've got your own projects, you know, internally. And so there's a lot of competition that's going on for the, that very scarce capital. It reminds me a bit of the royalty companies in your chair. It was uh, Nolan Watson was sitting in your chair yesterday yep. and I was asking with, talking with him about it. I was like, do you invest in juniors just to get a foothold in the door to secure the royalty? A sort of similar concept, like even if you just put in a couple million, which doesn't sound like much, but for, for a junior, it could be the world because sure. it could lead to that discovery hole or it could you know, just extend right. the drill program or something. Um, I, I see that as a role because you need to secure access. At least you'll, you'll be the first phone call. The question is at what cost does that? Sure. Right? And, and that's something that you, you have to consider doing and, and certainly think something we did do. Right, it just show support to the industry. Right. People are like, "Oh, I can call Phillips anytime, right. like uh, to get some support and maybe, uh, right. you know, shoot the shit a little bit, you know, <laughs> and, and get some feedback on what we're doing here." Right, to have a trusted partner. That's right. Yeah. Silver. Let, let's zoom out. We need to talk silver. Your your, your presentation title is uh, "Don't Be Short: Silver and Deficit." We we need to break that down a bit and run us a bit through the key highlights of the presentation. Well, look, there's 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 really two things you've got to start with, which is the supply demand balance. Um, but before going there, um, if you think about silver, silver has all of the characteristics gold has, right? It's a store of value, it's mo money, it's, it has its monetary value. And so the things that affect the gold price are also going to affect the silver price. And, and there's an element, about a third of the total demand for, for um, silver that is people investing, you know, buying silver bullion and in order to in order to to hold it but when you look at it in a, in a macro basis the silver market is about a 1.2 billion ounce market that of demand and it's about a billion ounce market of supply so you have a deficit in, between the supply demand which so it's unlike gold where you actually have these utilizations of of silver that um in fact 55% of all the demand for silver is in industrial applications. So quite a bit different in that sense from, from gold. Um, well, so it has all these characteristics gold does, but then it also has these industrial characteristics. And with this deficit that you're seeing, and this will be, it's now been three years in a row that we've had a deficit of 100 million ounces or more, and it's now in aggregate, it's half a billion ounce deficit. This year should be another 200, maybe even 300 million ounces uh, deficit. So we're getting close to three quarters of a billion ounces. And we probably will, over the course of the following year or two, be at a billion ounce deficit. So it's a very, very different market from gold in the sense that you have this, this use for, for silver that you don't have for gold. How is that supply deficit being covered? Like, where, where's the deficit coming? Like, how do you cover that gap? Yeah, it comes from above ground. Um, inventories and you got two categories you have reported inventories and by inventories I'm talking about silver that is on the COMEX or the LBMA or the Shanghai or and that's about 1.7 billion ounces mm -hmm. and then you have about another 3.3 billion ounces that is unreported um, you know, uh, silver that is sitting in bullion form or coin form someplace and that's that is generally speaking is held by individuals or, or institutions of some sort but primarily individuals so you've got repositories to, uh, around the world where people are storing that silver and the and you know and the big question is at what price do those people let that silver go 
And, you know, nobody knows what, what that is. You got all the different, different folks. But what I would suggest to you is that it's at quite a high price. It's, you know, people are not buying it at 30 to sell it at 32. <laughs> they're, they're buying it in order to, you know, sell it at a significant premium. Yeah, it's like oftentimes they buy it not to sell it. Right. Is that, right. Yeah. yeah, it's it is just held as insurance. Everybody has their price, obviously, yeah. but uh, many of them just buy, as you, as you say, as insurance. Yeah. So, and to protect themselves. Right. right. So, I, you know, when I think about that that above ground stock, and I think about when when are these people going to let it go? You know, I, I look back at what was the the high that you had previously, and on average, in 2011, the the, the average was thirty five dollars an ounce. So, I would suggest to you that it's unlikely that you'll see much silver get released below $35 an ounce. And then if you inflation adjust that $35, that's actually $48. So my my thought is, is that you're probably looking at something close to $50, which is also the all time high, before you really start to see silver come out in any measurable way from these above ground stocks, from this undisclosed, unreported silver. It, it feels like it's not affecting the price yet. Like all the moves not we've yet. seen, like the thirty-one dollars, more of a technical move than anything else. Oh, well, like, on the other hand, we, silver was twenty-two dollars, so so not not that long ago. So it has actually moved. It has outperformed um, outperformed gold you know, during over the course of the last I don't know certainly year. It has outperformed gold, and so you 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 have seen some price response. Yeah, but it, it's 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 dropped out from gold. Usually, what's the ratio is like three to one. So historically, where it outperforms, so let's say gold goes up 20%, sure. silver usually goes up uh, 60%. Sure. So I think gold is up year to date 14%, silver is only up 22%. So it's actually underperforming gold, if you were to apply that narrative, right? Yeah, Yeah. well, if you look at it over the last year, it's up 50% um, and and you know gold is only up, uh, I don't know, uh, 23% or yeah. something like that. It was a little closer then, but yeah. still not historic ratios, right? right. So. Um, Talking about ratios, and didn't I wasn't aware I was going to ask you gold silver ratio. Like, where, where do you think it should be? Well, um, it you know it's a perception of where it should be. Yeah. It is it is. There's no there's no rational basis for it to be at any sort of ratio. What I think you're going to see happen is there's going to be a realization of the real use for silver, and this growing deficit. And so what you'll see is that ratio, the perception of where that ratio should be will change. And it will, you know, currently we're at about 75. You have people talk about it in terms of, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they talk about it in terms of 80, maybe they talk about it in terms of 60, you know, but whatever. 13. Yeah, well, and, and, and you can go to 16 to 1. That's <laughs> that's sort of the historic. Yeah. Um, was that 16 or 13? I, 16, I keep confusing 16, the number. Yeah. Was Alexander Hamilton, 16 to 16, 1. Yeah. So, so, you know, where will it go? I, I don't know, but I, I certainly think the perception of where it should be will change with this deficit. You know, when you, when you say you've got to take a billion ounces out of inventory and you know, out of people's hands, you're going to have to have a higher you know, silver gold ratio. A lot of myths around the silver short squeeze back in 2021. And I'm curious, since I have you now, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, like, how, how close were we to a proper silver short squeeze? Look, that, that, is, that is a very hard thing mm-hmm. to achieve on a commodity. You, know, you maybe can do that with respect to a, to a single stock, but, and, 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 but, but doing it on a commodity is, uh, is a very, very difficult uh, Were we close to running out of silver? No, we've got, as I said, we've got all this silver yeah. that is that's the sitting, unreported. Yeah, yeah. It's saying, yeah, that's unreported. And if you think about those investors that own that, if they know this is a short term, you know, just squeeze someone trying to squeeze it, then they can just sell right right into it. They, you know, they they, they, they will provide the silver. Yeah. Your, your title, Don't Be Short, sort of leads to the assumption that there will be a short squeeze again. Absolutely. At some point. Yeah, All because right. and it's because of the deficit. The question is, though, like maybe as a follow-up to that, like how do we control the paper markets? Because uh, I had Keith Newmeyer here earlier this morning. He said, "Well, every, for every ounce of silver you produce, there's 230 ounce paper contracts out there." Like, how do we get that back into a better balance? And the question is, what is that balance even? Well, right? and 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 you know, with all due respect, 
the, the every market has a paper market versus the physical market. So I, I'm not so so fussed ab about that. That's just a reality. Uh, and 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 in fact, what I would encourage is people that need to be long silver. They can be long physical, or they can be long in the derivative markets. And 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 that's fine. It will ultimately end up having the same result, which is a higher higher silver price. Uh Ah, good, good point. Uh, the question is, uh, is, it, is the paper market too big? Because like the daily traded volumes of ounce per silver like far exceeds what can be, yeah. ever be produced. Yeah, and that, and that's because the silver market's so small. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you think about a billion ounces of silver demand, one mm. or silver supply, and you think about the price at thirty dollars. You're talking about thirty billion dollars. Mm. You know, how, you know that, <laughs> that that is infinitesimal. So it is such a small, small market. And there's and there's so little knowledge about the market, right? There is so so much misinformation, and there's so little recognition of what's physically happening with silver going into, particularly photovoltaics. Mm. You know, you think about um, it takes about four hundred thousand ounces to to produce one gigawatt of installed capacity of solar. So you think about that. We're now at um, call it 500 gigawatts of, of capacity that's going to be installed. So that's 200 million ounces that's going just to, to solar. So out of a 1.2 billion ounce market. So you're getting to the point where you're talking about 20% of the total market is going into solar. And if you go back in time, it was less than 8%. And that market is absolutely growing as well. Like, absolutely. Like and by policy, you, yeah. by policy, right? You've got governments that are saying, we're going to grow solar and this is what we're going to do. 100%. And um, you can see it in China. Sorry yeah. about that. Uh, yeah, no, no worries. It's a good, it's a good segue because um, I mentioned to you before we hit the record button, I had Chen Lin uh, on, on, the, on the show and uh, he's really a good Chinese, uh, China sure. insider. Right. Because he, he got some good documents coming out of China talking about uh, solar panel production. And what he highlighted is like that the Silver Institute is out to lunch for, when it comes to the forecast in terms of ounces needed for this, for solar panels. Sure. Right. Like way, way low. Um, still, you still, you know, um, calculating a, a deficit, but it should be two, 300 million ounces, probably higher. It's like, is that something you would agree? Is like you say, like, what, why, why the conservative approach there? I, I'm not, I'm not sure it is conservative. I mean, people are looking at data and they're, they're getting different sources of data and they're coming to different conclusions, but they all, the, the same, the, the, we're, we're all coming to the same conclusion, which is it is growing at an extraordinary rate. And with the new technologies that are being used with solar, um, it, it is it, it is the amount of silver that you're going to need per gigawatt is actually likely to go up. I've said 400,000 ounces um, with this new technology that's being deployed. It might end up being closer to 600,000 ounces. Um, so that makes a huge difference. But let's just wait and see how much of this actually gets deployed. I mean, that that's that that is speculation as to where we really are on that. Yeah. I had Joe Cavatoni sitting in your chair here. He's yep. the market yep, strategist yep. over at the World Gold Council. Yep. Fantastic guy to chat with. And I asked him a bit of a cheeky question. Is like, hey, is the World Gold Council eventually going to be an OPEC for, for the gold producers, right? Where we start, okay, we control the supply and we start setting prices or not setting prices, but starting to control the market dynamics a bit more aggressively. Is that a role you could see for the Silver Institute to get a bit more uh, control over the silver price? Um, well, think think about the supply side of silver and and, and number one, that the mining companies only produce 800 million ounces in a 1.2 billion ounce market. So, so no, we're not gonna be able to control the supply. We can't even produce enough silver to meet the demand. So you got a, a big component that's coming out of, of the, these above ground inventories. Um, that, that's, that's number one. Number two, if you think about the mining companies that are actually doing this, or the mines, um, two thirds of those mines are actually not silver mines. They're actually some other metal, lead, zinc, copper, gold, and it's a byproduct and it's a relatively small byproduct. So there's actually very little interest or incentive for those companies and those mines to, to really focus on, on silver. So it's a very, very small group of people, small group of mines that have this silver focus. Some of the producers held back silver in the past to see it's like we're going to sell maybe next quarter when we expect prices to be higher. What, what do you think of that tactic in that, in that sort of context? Well, realize that 
as I just said, that the, the production primarily comes from um, lead, zinc, copper. And though, when it comes from those metals, it's, it's not coming out in a form that you can actually hold back. It, it no. is a concentrate that has to go to a smelter. And then the outturn from that smelter actually produces the, 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 the silver and it's way down the line. So the company really has no control over that inventory and they've got to, they've got to deliver the concentrate. They don't have a place to store this great big pile of, of concentrate. They've got to actually get it to the, to the smelters. So, um, I, you know, I can appreciate those companies that produce a Doré bar that only has to be be refined them you know having the ability to hold back but for the for the majority of the industry can't do not it. a possibility okay yeah. now interesting um very last question i mentioned gold well gold council and they've really stepped up their marketing lately to, to you know gold right. store value security security asset for for investors is the silver institute doing something similar is it marketing the role of silver yeah i mean i i think so i mean that was one of the reasons why i became the chair of the silver institute was to to focus on that and one of the reasons why i'm continuing on the executive committee you know the first place we really are starting is who is the real audience that we have no. um the purpose of the silver institute is very similar to to the gold World Gold Council. It is to provide information to the market. It's not to make a call on the market. It's not to try to control the silver market. All it's all it's really designed to do is to give people real information, real knowledge, so that they can can you know make informed decisions. And we we believe that if you do that, and you're doing it to the right audience, it will make a fundamental difference in the in the price of of silver because people aren't going to want to be in be short. They're going to start to understand this real deficit that's occurring. Phillips, what's next for you? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm uh, I'm going to stay involved with the Silver Institute through the uh, through the executive committee. Uh, but I what I do know is that I will continue to be in the mining industry more generally. Fantastic. I can't, can't lose you. You had so much experience with Hecla and, you know, moving from 80 million market cap to 4 billion. You've seen a lot. So we need your experience in this sector. So I'll be here. Thank you so much for your okay. time. It was a great pleasure Hi. catching up with you. Really appreciate enjoy it. our conversations because we've had a few over over the, over the years. So appreciate really appreciate it. it. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the floor of the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. If you like this conversation, please hit that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment. We really want to hear from you. It makes a big difference to us because we love constructive feedback. And of course, it helps us spread the message. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots, lots more here from Boca Raton.